Greetings, everyone. We're going to get started. Please come on down if you like. Bring your food. Keep on eating. I start momentarily. Good. All right. So welcome, everyone, to the first um, HAI vodcast. I'm Vanessa Parley, Director of Research Programs here at HAI. And I'm Go Wong, an associate professor here in music with Courtesy in Computer Science. Yeah, so this quarter we're piloting a HAI human-centered vodcast, so kind of a hybrid podcast, live audience seminar thing that we're trying out. Um, we really want to hear from our audience members to uh, learn what you all are thinking about what you really want from these AI tools and systems. Um, so in our first episode, we'll briefly discuss what Gun and I have been thinking about along this topic. Um, Go will sh share some learnings from his AI and music class, and then we're going to open the floor to our in-person and um, online audiences to, again, like hear what you all are thinking. We have some prompt questions. Um, for our online audience, feel free to use the chat function in Zoom, or we have a Slido link, and we have um, the Slido feed up here with Gun and I today. In future episodes, we'll be looking at various topics, um, AI and research, AI and creativity, AI and education. Um, it depends, and we'll have speakers joining us who focus in those areas. Um, go ahead. Did I miss anything? No, that sounds great. And, uh, and yeah, we are, we're really excited to be here, and we're excited for this vodcast. And we didn't even know that vodcast was a real word until recently. And so we're going to be tackling hard-hitting questions such as, what is what makes AI human centered? What does that actually mean? That's not an easy question, and also it depends on who you ask. Also, what is a vodcast? I'm going to try to figure that out as well. So, on that note, I, I you know I, I thought we'd give you a little bit of a backstory of how we come to actually do this HAI vodcast. Um, but also in that, you'll kind of see what this vodcast is really meant to be about. In fact, I we actually don't know what this is about exactly, and I even brought a little lucky charm here, Vanessa. Um, we need it. We need it. Yeah. This is, uh, in case you're wondering, this is actually this is my office, and this actually comes from a video game I play. I mean, it's like a, it, so if you play StarCraft, this is a pylon. It's meant to provide energy. So I'm going to put this here. This has no AI in it, but it's got a cool light. It also has a USB port so you can charge your phones here. So I'm going to put this right here. Which is very useful. It's actually pretty useful. Um, and so, uh, with this pylon in place, uh, so, well, how do we get here, Vanessa? <laughs> um, so, uh, full disclosure, I'm an incoming associate director to Stanford HAI, um, even though I've been kind of in the orbit of HAI since its inception some five years ago. Um, but now I'm kind of, you know, kind of entering this and trying to learn the ropes. And Vanessa has been so kind to help me to learn the lay of the land. So and then we got to talking, and, and, uh, and then what happened? Yeah. So, yeah, I was sharing with Gug kind of my role here. Um, the research programs and education programs are meant to bring together interdisciplinary voices um, and new perspectives in into the development and deployment of artificial intelligence um, and sharing that with the broader audience. So, um, yeah, Gun, and I just started talking about like what that really means. What does it mean to develop these technologies and, and some of our outstanding questions and thought, it would be fun to discuss and to bring all of your voices into the conversation as well. And as many of you know, Vanessa is our uh, director of research programs here at HAI. Um, and, uh, and we have, in fact, in the upcoming episode, I think we're going to be asking you a lot more questions about research and AI and HAI here, in fact, on our very next episode in one month. Um, but as far as this, you know, uh, we also thought we'd share a little bit of our backstory, you know, um, in this segment that we call origin stories. Um, yeah, so that's me some many, many moons ago uh, as, a, as an undergrad at Duke University. Um, I studied computer science. And, and then I remember after I graduated from Duke, it was back 2000. I like to tell my students I'm, I'm older than the trees. Uh, be younger than the mountains. And uh, I, I'm on my way to, to, uh, to, to Princeton to also do a PhD in, in computer science. And I was, in, in my application to, to grad school, I said, you know, what I want to do is computer music. And 
Within that, I want to build the world's most badass algorithmic composition engine. That's actually what I wrote in my, something like that in my entrance application. But on my way up to New Jersey, right, I stopped into this house band. I was living in DC at the time. And this is this party, this band, the band was tight. I was like, man, these guys rock. And I go up to them afterwards and I tell them, y'all rock. And I talk to the guitarist and I, I tell them what I'm doing. It's like, I'm going up to grad school and study like generative music engines. And he just looked at me and very earnestly asked, what's the point? For me, that was a really good question. What's the point? Because it made me step, take a step back. When I went to grad school, that question was in my mind. And, and I realized I couldn't answer that question. Um, not very well, not for me. So instead of trying to build the most world from a badass algorithmic composition engine, um, I, ended up, I took a step back and I built a programming language for music. That's Chuck. That's still being used today. And, um, and I thought, if I didn't know what this question meant, but maybe I can build a tool that others could potentially use and build whatever they think they want to do with technology and music. So that's, you know, and some in 20 years later, 23 years later, you know, we're sitting here and, and I think this question of what's the point is I think is stronger than ever for me. And, and I'm helping myself. I want to understand this when it comes to AI, to technology. And I think that's kind of, you know, one of the for me, the kind of the precipitating motivations for for this vodcast where we ask, what do we really want? from our tools. So that, Vanessa, what about you? Your turn. Um, so that's me in my freshman dorm room before the first football game um, at Arizona State. Um, so when I was thinking about what I wanted to do in college, I was thinking, um, I grew up dancing. So I'm like, I maybe I'll study dance. And my dad was like, well, you know, if you study dance, that's great. You can do what you want, but you have to pay your own bills when you graduate. Um, so I was like, oh, okay. Um, so I chose engineering, industrial engineering. And I was like, I like math. It's a little creative. That seemed, it, I like making things more efficient. That seemed all good. Um, and I did like it. And I ended up also getting a master's in engineering management and computational mathematics. It all, like I liked my courses. I like what I'm doing now. Um, but coming to HAI, I started, as I started talking to more of like the social scientists and the humanists, um, I found it really, really interesting the way that they think through problems, which was very different than what I learned in all of my engineering classes. Um, it was really eye-opening and sometimes mind-blowing. So that's um, really what kind of I'm looking to do more of here is kind of bring all of these different disciplines together and, and really challenge the way we all think to make sure that, um, yeah, these technologies work, work for everyone. Um, are you a Stanford football fan? No, I, I still don't buy Stanford gear, but no one's in the Pac-12 anymore. So yeah, I, I mean, I went to Duke, which is an Atlantic Coast Conference, and now guess who else is in the ACC? <laughs> Us. Yeah. So uh, I have to yeah, I have to choose. So you, you know, uh, I never thought I'd, I'd live to see that day, but here we are. Um, yeah. Well, so we're. Yeah. Do you want to talk a little bit? Oh, oh, and then also, yes, we cannot forget. So this is Mads and Isabel. They are also part of our vodcast team. Mads is over there. She's our event lead. Um, and Isabel is over here. She's kind of our researcher, writer, creative director. We're still determining her title, but they are both amazing as well. Um, and then, yeah, with that, do you, want to, do you want to talk a little bit about our preamble and, and kind of our vision for this? Yes, so... so Vanessa and I and the team have come up with the following preamble, which will continue to evolve and maybe together, uh, but also something I think we want to set the tone every episode and, and so what this, what this, you know, what our vodcast is actually about. So uh, five points here from, from our preamble, and I'm going to read them. One, I think it's the question, what do we really desire? What do we really want from AI? Two, is this observation that we live in a time when advancements in AI technology is shaping our world, when while critically outpacing our understanding of this technology in various humanistic contexts, I'm talking about cultural, social, ethical, historical, and others. Three, well, I mean, look at us. I mean, we are here at Stanford, right? And HAI is part of it. We are Stanford HAI. And Stanford is one of the most powerful academic institutions on the planet, located in the heart of Silicon Valley. And yet, 
it is all too easy to be in a profound bubble. Much of the world knows and cares about AI far less or far differently than what we might assume here. It is also all too easy to, to be sure of ourselves as the technology creators while remaining out of touch with the rest of the world, we tell ourselves that, that more technology is the solution, for technology is what we know. You know, it's, we're both engineers by training, right? And, and we are eager to apply our craft. Unfortunately, it is, again, all too easy to do so with an impoverished and, and shallow understanding of the social, cultural, historical, and other contexts while not even considering the, the possibility of the problems in the world that we face, that all of us face, are seldom lack of technology problems, but entrenched human problems, including, I would add, technology itself. But of course, we keep moving fast because that is good for business. Even when we, quote, design tech for social good, unquote, we, we too often just end up making something slightly more convenient. Because slightly more convenient fits the prevailing economic narrative. This is the bubble, the technology cave we don't know we are living in. That's point number three. Four, <laughs> we need to interrogate ourselves, I think, to better understand how we as individuals and as communities would want to live with AI technology and through our creations, how we might want to live with one another. We will seek distinctions in this in our series, in our podcast, between notions of intelligence and wisdom. Um, for example, we might say the working definition of intelligence as an artificial intelligence and just intelligence in general is possessing the means to achieve what you desire, right? Then wisdom, we might say, is the capacity to critically evaluate your desires in the first place and to also evaluate the means that you, you have to achieve them. And I think. We need both, right? And I, I feel like here, if you're here, you're smart. Like there's no one here who's not intelligent. But I think the question for all of us is like, do we have the tools to be wise? So I think that's also part of our motivation. And five, above all, above all, um, what does it mean to do AI with the uh, heart and compassion? And that's the, those are the questions. And those are, that's our, uh, that's our preamble. Yeah. And uh, I, can you, let's talk a little, like pick a few points from that. Talk, tell us a yes. little more about what you mean by the bubble. So, so I, I, as, as you guys can tell, right, we're here to like do some HAI real talk, maybe some AI real talk. And that's something we want everyone to do as we get into these topics. And it's something that we want to create above all is this safe place for all of us to feel safe to, to self-examine and also to be self-critical, which I think is really not in the culture of, of what we do, not just this place, but like just kind of society in, in, in general, but also this place, whether it's Stanford HAI or Stanford. So feel free to get your HAI real talk on, people and start thinking about the questions, but also being very honest and feel free to connect this to what you're thinking about and how you're feeling in life. That's what this is about. And, and so, yes, the bubble. Vanessa, let's drill down on, on some of the, this, this bubble here. Um, so first let's talk about this, AI FOMO. What is AI FOMO? Well, before I explain what it is, let me just show up hands and people in the room and feel free to pipe up over uh, Zoom as well. How many people like feel like you can relate to having some AI FOMO? You know this question I ask, I, I give a lot of talks in different places and I go, the moment I leave Silicon Valley and I go to other places, it, right? That's not this place. And it, it, sometimes it's, it can be just as metropolitan as, as this place. And I ask the same question, expecting this kind of response where- For our online audience, almost everyone raised their hand in the room. Exactly. It, this, it, and I, I asked the same question, Vanessa, and I get crickets. There's like five people that raise their hands out of maybe a room of 500. It's like, it's like they're, they're like, what's AI FOMO? And then I, yes, if you said, whoa, <laughs> that's how I felt the first time. I was like, oh, that totally did not land. Because AI FOMO seems to be a very special Silicon Valley product. 
it's because, and now to define AI FOMO, right? Because I think if you raise your hand, you know exactly what I'm talking about, but it comes in different forms. AI FOMO is the fear of missing out on AI. I want to give you a specific example. Um, so I'm, I'm here, you know, as I said, I'm in, in the Department of Music with the Curtis Computer Science. I have a lot of talented, talented music students coming up to me and saying, Guh, 2023, should I have been taking deep learning classes these last four years? I didn't because I just didn't want to. But now I feel like, am I getting left behind? Should I have been doing this? Right. And that's one form of AI FOMO. Another form of AI FOMO is, I think, actually, ironically, the people who are working on AI. Am I right? Like, I think the FOMO is like, oh, yeah, I'm working as fast as I can, but am I going to, is someone else going to actually publish this before I do? Because the pace of things that are going is so fast. Or we, do we have, we don't have the same kind of access to data as, say, the industry. And there's, a, there's data FOMO. There's also, there's also, there's also me. Like, I think I taught, my music AI class out of some form of AI FOMO. I was like, well, as a teacher, should I be, as a computer music researcher and teacher, should I be teaching something about AI? And that got me to teach that class. Anyway, so I think AI FOMO is a, is a real thing. And you raised your hands, hands too, like I did. What, what? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think it's, it's just hard because it's, everything's going so fast, everything's moving so fast. Um, you know, I feel what I learned in school is like kind of old now. Should I be taking like deep learning classes? But also like I need in my role, I need to know more broadly about what's going on on the ethics side and the education side. And like, how can I know about all those things? Um, I was telling God when we were talking earlier, like the pace that papers are published is just kind of, it's like, it's frozen. Like I can't even read papers anymore because I don't even know where to start. Um, so I've tried to like overcome that by by trying to block out some of some of the noise and, and focus on one, but um, yeah, I end up reading like titles. Yeah, at some point, I think we're not going to have time to even sift through the titles of AI papers that are coming out. That's the rate. So keep this in mind, but also keep this feeling in mind because we're going to be asking you about AI FOMO later in this hour. Um, and then the bubble. Yeah, what do we make of this, Vanessa? Yeah. So this was really interesting to me when I saw it. So this is a Pew Research study that came out in August, so not too long ago, um, where they asked adults um, if they had heard of ChatGPT and kind of like what they thought of it. Um, and in total, only 24% of people who had heard of ChatGPT actually um, had ever used it. So like, again, question, how many of you in here have used ChatGPT? Yeah, everybody, basically. Um, and, and that 24% is only people have heard of it. So then um, I think the article mentions like 18% of, it equates like 18% of US adults have ever used ChatGPT. Whereas we're in this place where it's like AI is changing everything. Like, what is it going to do this? What is it going to do that? If only 18% of adults in America even like think anything of it. Um, and there was another stat in there, I think about how many people think it'll impact their jobs. And it was like 19% of people think it'll impact their jobs, which was just like so opposite to kind of the narrative that we have here, which I don't know which what is right or what is wrong, but um, it was just really interesting. That sounds like a great reason to question things. Um, and along with that, I think is, you know, this is Pew Research is, is some for the, if you don't know, is a, is a public, it's a think tank, uh, nonpartisan think tank based, based in Washington, DC. And, uh, you know, this, this is an adjacent article to that. Anyway, uh, we recommend going, you know, find out more about this, but this one, is that people actually do, <laughs> I think there's a vague concern, <laughs> shall we call it, about AI. And, and a lot of this is, I think, related also to AI FOMO in the sense that it, it's interesting. It's like, almost ironically, the way to kind of overcome or start overcoming AI FOMO is to learn more about AI. And then it gives you the tools to figure out, I guess, when AI you're actually missing out, maybe if you don't do it. And also in places where like, oh, you, you were never missing out. Um, so, yeah, yeah. So I think with that, we'll have you share a little bit about an AI course. Um, and God talked a lot in this course about this idea of AI FOMO. So this was a, this is a course that was born out, as I mentioned, out of AI FOMO. All right. And I taught it as a critical making course, which I'll, I will explain. So I'm going to kind of simulate the lecture here. All right. So lecture one, this is literally the title of lecture one. It's like, is this even a good idea? 
And I was talking about music and AI, but also I was talking about the class too. So I wasn't even sure I should be teaching this class. Is this even a good idea? Which I've, we've come to learn is a pretty good question as a, as a builder of anything, as a designer of anything. It's like the thing I'm building, is that even a good idea? Like, I think if we all asked that a little bit more, maybe that wouldn't be the worst thing. And also we started and ended with this question, what do we really want from AI? And students come from all different backgrounds here on campus. We have some music students. We have a lot of computer science students, a lot of symbolic system students, students from the D school, from biology, from, um, from the international policy. Everyone's interested in something about kind of music and AI. And, but we also found that everyone did have some form of AI FOMO. It was AI FOMO that brought a lot of people into the class which is quite interesting. And then we talk about things, this isn't from the first lecture now, but it's this idea that, you know, it, we come to think about AI systems, every AI system as an argument for how might, we might wanna live with AI, right? And, and we're trying to find tools that we could think about the things that we build as engineers and as tool builders, as designers. And so this is kind of the thing that we were working with, this idea that really what you're building is more than a tool. It's really an argument for how you might want to live with a tool. It's a cultural argument. And so with that, we began to question things. For one, we, we question a lot about kind of the assumptions we make with, with AI. Right? So let's do a little exercise here together. It's a little like kind of like a logic toolbox. All right. And it has to do with this, this, you know, and kind of argument and kind of the formal argument, right? Like, who knows the difference between validity and soundness? Okay, a few hands go up, all right? So I'm gonna, for everyone to make sure on the same page, this is how basically they're defined. An argument is valid if the conclusion follows from the premises. That's usually how validity is, is one of the ways validity is defined. I'm gonna give you some examples. An argument is sound, on the other hand, if all the premises are actually true, all right? So that's the definition. So here's an example. Right. See if you can see spot kind of won't. Let's say I make the claim that all toasters are items made of gold. All right. And make a second claim. All items made of gold are time travel devices. These are my two claims. I'm going to then complete my argument. Therefore, all toasters are time travel devices. Question for you all. Is this a valid argument? Yes, it actually is a valid argument by the definition we have, right? Is this sound? No. So that's, that's kind of the difference. And it's interesting to think about because I think we, it's very easy to actually be kind of given the premises and take those for granted. And then basically say, well, if the premises are true, then conclusions must follow. But if the conclusions be true, therefore soundness, I think the premises itself have to be true. So applying this back to this idea of critical thinking about AI and, and critical making, right? So in my courses, students build a lot of stuff, write a lot of code, work with AI in different ways. But then we're also trying to think as broadly as possible about the things that we're actually making. And that's the critical part. It's the making, but also it's the critical thinking. And so it's a, you know, critical thinking is about questioning the conclusion, but also it's about questioning the premises. So, so this is a kind of a bit of a, I guess, a philosophical window into kind of how we in music and AI have been thinking about this question, right? So it's basically then it's this question of questioning foregone premises. And for this next segment, we're going to try to do that. Um, <laughs> here's some foregone premises that, that we've, you know, we've, we've identified. And this doesn't mean these are not true. Right. It just means that maybe we should think about these and it's easy. These are things that it's easy to kind of assume, especially when it comes to AI. So here's one. Anything that could be automated should be automated. Right. And therefore, we should just go and automate everything. That's that's could be said to be a foregone premise. And and the idea is that, well, this is not that is not true. It kind of depends on it depends. And then at least this is a question that needs to be asked. Next, well, progress in AI should be measured by how indistinguishable AI is from humans. So on this, you know, this is, I think it's a question about benchmark. 
right, among other things, of how do we measure progress in AI and AI research? And so Vanessa, Director of Research Programs, I was wondering, do you? <laughs> um, yeah, so I'm Benjamin. So the Turing Trap is an article um, from Eric Brynjolfsson, who's, who's a fellow here at HAI, um, and he talks about benchmarks often as well. But a lot of these benchmarks, which are kind of goals that usually technologists have set to determine whether AI is good or not, or improving or not. Um, most of them at this point, especially over the past few years, have been saturated. So they're meeting or exceeding human capabilities in question answering and computer vision. Um, but so, so what does that mean for AI? And, and I feel like still our systems are not really like as good as we want them to be. So what are the benchmarks that we need to set to um, develop those systems? Should benchmarks even be set? As an engineer, I would say, probably, I, I tend to yes, but maybe that's a question to, to think about. Um, and yeah, these, these benchmarks are goals. So as you set them, many researchers then try to meet them. Um, so we need to think critically, I think, about what we want from our systems and set the benchmarks appropriately so that we're building systems in that direction, um, thinking about values, the overall societal benefits, um, different cultures. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, that's the trap, isn't it, right? I mean, the, the, the so-called Turing trap, it really is related to this. I mean, it's called the Turing trap because it's related to like the Turing test, which is... You know, a system is, of course, like good if it's indistinguishable from humans. And and while that may be a very interesting benchmark, it, it, to your point, it does seem like, you know, what about cultural benchmarks, right? What about kind of social benchmarks? And I, admittedly, I think it seems like those those are harder in some ways to measure because, like, if we can't if we we can't tell if it's an AI or not, that's almost easy. But to say is this thing actually good, and for whom is it good? That seems like a much that's a much more complicated question. So this seems like a great topic that we will we will talk about even more next next episode when we talk about actually the research world. So maybe moving on from our you know move on with these kind of these more things making things more convenient or less frustrating is always desirable. I see this a lot actually in our in, in students. I see this a lot in myself too. Um, it's like you know it, the tool is good if it just makes something more convenient. And a lot of times that's actually true. You know, I like, you know, I don't love peeling potatoes. So I'm really, I like the potato peeler, right? But actually there are people who actually like peeling potatoes for different reasons. That's a different story. But I'm glad for certain time-saving convenience tools, you know. But at the same time, I think, I, I also have to wonder as an educator, like, aren't there, are, what are things that actually we don't want to be more, or at least not, you know, it's not so simple. For example, I think learning is like, Learning is like confusing. It's frustrating. But if you took those things away, like, are we actually learning? Because I think being confused and being frustrated is actually what gets you to really understand and learn something. Also to feel like you've, it's kind of like climbing a mountain. It's hard. Maybe you can be airlifted to the top of that mountain, but I think going through the uphill up the up the uphill hill climb and it's arduous it's difficult and it's kind of miserable in times but i think it feels different and you've attained something different i would say at the end so i think that would be my reason for on the questioning kind of things like this and there's more there's a lot and we don't have to talk about all of them today but we want to see these because we we're hoping that you know we want to hear your thoughts on this you know for example here's another one an engineer's role is to solve problems it seems almost like a given I mean, we're both engineers, and I think we've grown up in, in cultures that I think very much would be like almost take this as a, you know, well, as a foregone premise. Um, and also, an engineer's role is to optimize, is to optimize, right? And, 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 and also, I think in an educational context, competitiveness is the highest virtue of education. Is that the case? Because I, I, you know, I mean, it sounds like it shouldn't be the case, but if you look around, it's, I feel it so much here, Vanessa. It's, I've been here for my 16th year as faculty here. And I've, Stanford has, has changed so much in 16 years. And I know there are those who are here even, even longer than, than I, you know, older than trees, younger than the mountains. But like the, but I've seen students kind of like 
you know, it's, it's, and also in the way that we teach students, we're actually kind of just reinforcing this culture of like, how do you make yourself more competitive? And that's can be measured in terms of, I don't know, not just grades or accomplishments, but like the, the kind of job, the kind of internship that you'll land and a job you'll get kind of grad program you'll get into. Um, so anyway, these are foregone premises. I think that are also very related to kind of AI and AI education. Um, One comment about the optimization to a little story. So I, I mentioned, yeah, I'm, I'm, you know, engineering background. I, and being here at HAI has really changed like how I think about things um, given my interactions with kind of the humanists and social scientists. So I used to, um, I would go into like ice cream shops and be like, this could be more efficient. Like I need to get my ice cream faster. And, um, and then I, I was having conversations here and, and it just made me think about this idea of optimization. Like, why am I trying to optimize my like ice cream experience? It smells good in the ice cream shop. Like I like the smell of ice cream. Like, is it fine if I just stand in line at ice cream longer? Like, why was that something that I was like trying to optimize? Um, so anyways, I think about that like often now is, is yeah, you're trained in the most efficient way to do something um, is the best way. And maybe that's not always the case. Yeah, I mean, I mean, you think about it. You have, you, I assume that many of you who are in the room at least, and maybe those, and many of those who are on Zoom live in the area. I mean, how many times when you got to go from like, I don't know, Palo Alto or Stanford to up to the city, to San Francisco, and you could take 101 or you could take 280. You know, 101 is actually sh shorter, maybe even faster. Okay, if there's traffic, maybe like maybe there's also traffic, but even if traffic is not an issue, like how many of you are like, you know what, I want to take 280, you know, because yeah, people raise it, yeah, you you know, am I right? Yeah, people like, and why do you do that? Why take 280, people? Anyone feel free to yell it out? It's beautiful. It's a, it's just, it's just a, it's a be beautiful place, and I drive on 280, and I take 280 when I when I truly can, even I know if it's a little bit longer. And it makes me happy to live, makes me feel good about living in this place. And it reminds me that there's such beauty here in, so in the valley, as <laughs> we've come to call it, um, such natural beauty. So something to think about. Um, and I guess, you know, for me, like who says someone who was like just so disciplinarily confused Vanessa like I'm like I was trained as an engineer as a computer scientist and I got all my degrees are in computer science but my appointment here is in music and I'm kind of a citizen of no place you know I don't know if I quite belong anywhere and but yet I also feel like I kind of sort of belong everywhere but I sort of don't but I truly kind of don't anyway it makes by the way it makes like tenure promotion a, a total venture and that's for a different episode. I can tell you about my tenure adventure. But I wonder in that kind of like in the liminal space of disciplines about kind of what the role of engineers. is. Sometimes I wonder, you know, what if our role as engineers, as tool builders, as designers, is it's not so much problem solving as the end goal, but a kind of flourishing. You know, what if it's to help us to flourish as individuals and also as communities? And I feel like problem solving in this context would then be naturally part of that. It's a huge part of that, but it's not. But this is a different framing. And it's just like your point about benchmarks. Because you put a benchmark out there and we accept the benchmark that everyone works towards that benchmark. And that changes the way that it would change the very projects we undertake, mm -hmm. the, the, the methods we would actually take to actually try to, 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 to actually do that project. Anyway, so we have no answers. But we thought we'd just post this out there for as a as a as a thought, um, and uh, and one final one about talking about art. If AI, if AI gets good enough, humans will not need to make art anymore. I mean, I, I mean, as an artist, it's kind of like, what do you think about this? No, I don't think, I don't think um, it's it'll be just a diff. I, I'm I, my opinions are morphing as times change, but. I, I do think that there will always be artists and there will be perhaps a new kind of art that adds to our collection of art. Yeah, I mean, I, my opinions are also changing. It's so interesting. Like 20 years earlier, I was like, I'm going to grad school to make badass algorithmic composition engines. 20 years later, I, I was actually thinking about this, actually just in preparation for, for, for our vodcast, Vanessa, and I was, 
I actually realized what a crisis of faith I actually am having about AI, even though I teach it, I work with it. It is a crisis of faith. Um, you know, if there's part of me that's like, what if like maybe the whole point of art is that we make it. And that's it. And it's just, it's the, make, it's the mountain climbing, right? And, and the whole point of art is that we generate. And if it was generated too much for us, but maybe to your point, maybe there can be this happy medium. I was once asked this question by, uh, by a colleague in philosophy, uh, Professor Juliana, and she, she was like, God, do you think we'll ever have robot musicians? I was like, I mean, that's she like that. no, she doesn't. Like that. <laughs> that was kind of what I, my, was her voice in, in my head, like, God, what about this? I was like, you mean is that as good as humans? She's like, yeah, that's that's what I mean. I said, you know, and I gave this cheeky answer. No one was talking to the philosopher. I was like, but I kind of believe this. I reckon we'll have true robot musicians the day we have true robot philosophers. I have no idea what a robot philosopher is supposed to do. But I also have no idea what a robot musician is supposed to do either. So maybe that's not. Of course, she got immediately said, you know, ha, because that would imply machines will have understood something more subtly human. I said, yeah, isn't music? more than notes on a page or sound waves of the air, more than a product, it's also a process, you know, with meaning. And I have to wonder that in this age of so, where AI can seemingly do so much, like we're, you know, how do we make of that? And, and, and it's, so I guess that brings us back to this question, what do we really, really want from it all? You know, is it a big red button or is it different ways to put humans into loop? And yes, I think for those of you wondering, what, what do you mean big red button? Well, we talk about this in my classes as like basically the thing where you just like ask for something and you get it back. It's kind of like the idea of like kind of the ancient Oracle of Delphi. It's like you pose the question, the Oracle, she will give you often a cryptic answer, but that's meant to be the answer, right? And no work is shown. There's no explanation. And often the answer is actually rather cryptic. And in this sense, it's like these are you know, in the technology sense, a big red button is the thing that you basically, well, either press or maybe prompt and you get back something that you want and you don't kind of, you kind of don't know what's happening. The middle is, is rather unclear what happened, right? And we're kind of, but there are different ways it seems to, to think about humans. Um, you know, what if instead of thinking of automation as the removal of human involvement from a task, we imagined it as selective inclusion of human participation? And if you think about the fields of interactive machine learning and, you know, kind of intersections of AI and HCI, you know, this is kind of one of the questions I think of, maybe it's one of the questions I think of our time. Like with this technology that's never, this cat is not going back in the bag, it's out. But now that it's out, how do we bring these kind of human interactive and curative kind of con uh, agency into it? With this, you know, there, you know, I just want to say in, in, my, in my field of computer music, and, you know, Rebecca, you know, Professor and Dr. Rebecca Fabrink, who teaches uh, in London, she's kind of one of the giant beacons where she's able to meld machine learning and now increasingly like other forms of AI, um, human computer interaction, and also music. And, you know, she's built tools that we actually use, including Weckinator. I'll show you a few examples from this. And this is Rebecca, actually. First, I'm going to show you a webcam controlled drum machine. This project is set up to recognize three different positions. Me standing in front of the camera, me standing to the side of the camera, and my hand in front of the camera. For each position, my drum machine is going to play a different combination of drums. By the way, the drum code is written using Chuck. So if you know a little bit of Chuck, you might recognize the sounds. This is usually some old school ML, by the way, <laughs> right? And this is something that actually she talks about. It's kind of this idea of a small data mindset in an age of huge data. And, but the idea is that if you compare human interaction with AI machine learning, actually there's some other thing they can do entirely. It completely reframes how you think about it. In this case, this is a system she trained in minutes, not months, right? Um, and you can be used to do, people have used it to build really playful, creative things. Here is a wave bot. That's all it does. It waves at you. 
trained in minutes. Um, so with this, uh, you know, just, just to end, wrap up kind of this, this, this part about this class, I want to show you some of the things my students have made. Uh, one with made kind of like interactive sound poetry. This is just taking basically like, uh, like basically um, um, unsupervised kind of a word dictionary, something like word to vec and using that, building a tool to traverse that space, but putting it into kind of like a sonic poetry. Yeah, it gets really unhinged when it when someone's email, like Susan, someone. <laughs> Susan Reamer at boltsun.com. Well, that was in that was in the dictionary. All right. So um, yeah, it's a lot more than a than, you know, kind of there's a lot more to AI than comp based and generative. And while those things are, you know, certainly very interesting, because they but there's also more. And just because we have what can it be like a yes and kind of a proposition when it comes to this? And also this idea, you know, what do we really want from AI? Do we want oracles? Or when do we want oracles? Maybe there are times that we do just want an oracle. And there are other times where we just want a tool that we can learn and work with, right? Speaking of tools, this is a, uh, this is a video I, I made uh, for my students. And uh, trained on the Beatles with apologies to the Beatles. <laughs> Yeah, so sorry about that. And uh, for my students, I will I know any amount of no some no amount of cringe will stop me from helping my students learn all right and uh so we have 15 minutes left okay. I just want to make sure we have time for audience yes so i think this is actually this is our let me see i'm going to show you one more and this one is kind of a, a <laughs> this one's kind of a this one's a kind of a joke um but it's a very thoughtful joke so i'm going to, I'm going to show you this video <laughs> Insta classic, and uh, Matt, who who made this, I just want to share this kind of this this one, his reflection. It's part of the critical thinking on, on on the making. I really enjoyed this design. I think it's easy to adopt this toxic capitalistic mindset that everything you do or make has to be productive or for something. But when we follow that dogma, we forget to make beautiful things just because they're beautiful. Do funny things just because they're funny, or make stupid projects just because they're stupid. There's so much beauty in doing things just because. It was nice to take a pause in life and make something just for the sake of making it and for a grade, but that's more of an afterthought, right? I bet Matt takes 280 when he can. <laughs> so with that, I think we can 
we have more stuff. We can save those for other episodes. And where we want to go to is actually now the question and answers. And I think this is the slide I always have a lot in my classes is that questions, you know, answers are great, but answers are like kind of an endpoint. When you get an answer, you're done. But a good question, a good question is like forever good. It's always generative. It will generate more good questions. So answers are valued, but an well, questions are, are, I think, in the long run, the good questions that I think that will shape us. And to quote James Baldwin, the purpose of art is to lay bare the questions that have been hidden by the answers. And I, I, as someone who is an engineer, but also has like been confusedly like been in the arts, <laughs> who is in the arts and engineering, I, I feel like this question is so relevant. I mean, this, this sentiment is so relevant for technology and especially for AI, where we seemingly already have the answers, but what does it mean? I think that's the unpacking. So with this, I guess we want to. Yeah. Yeah. So let's open it up to all of you for questions. We do have some just or comments too. Like if you don't have a question, just have a reflection. That's great as well. Um, we have some online. Um, the most upvoted. So I'll do online first and we'll open it up in, in real life. Um, what I want from AI is a better term for what we are developing using worry about. I know it, it's too late, but could we talk about augmented insight instead? I don't want something artificial. I do. And no one can define intelligence. Can you suggest a better term, machine thinking? I don't have an answer. No answer. I have no answers. Question. What do y'all think? Question. A good question. Rock on whoever asked that question. But anyone have any also thoughts on that or questions of your own, sentiments of your own with? Yeah, please use the microphone so that online can hear as well. Yeah, I think um, I think in like most definitions of intelligence are circular in nature because uh, it's so introspective that we come back to the same thing. For example, um, the definition that you gave, while very apt, it makes sense to only beings that can have desire and beings that can have desire sort of presume intelligence of some form. So I think uh, we, uh, we've we become obsessed with the A in AI, where I think we need to dig in more in the I. And um, the more front frontiers we're sort of breaching, it's, sort, it's become more of like in our faces um, that, okay, wait, do you even know what intelligence is sort of... Uh, that's a great point. I mean, I think it's your, it's your, you're saying like for something to have intelligence by that definition, you also have to have desire. Does, does AI desire and how do we know that it does and how will we, if it ever, if it doesn't, assuming it now, and if it ever does desire, how will we know that is actually desiring? That's, thank you for that. Um, I think we had, Hi, I just wanted to do a little comment on the last um, thought. I think a way to think about the intelligence is a differentiation with consciousness and how something that has zero intelligence could also be conscious. And we can see that through, you know, approach or rejecting and sort of the movements that even a very small organism might do. Whereas something could also be highly intelligent, but don't have any consciousness at all. And I think sometimes we confuse the two and um, see the intelligence as a conscious behavior where it's, it's mainly because of a training that is uh, perhaps more predetermined than you know, a free will that might come from consciousness. Very true. It's it's, it's in, entails so much. And I mean, it also reminds me a little bit of like this definition of intelligence and how we measure intelligence. Mm -hmm. Like IQ has gotten a lot more recently like questioned on whether that's the appropriate mechanism to say whether somebody is intelligent. And, um... The definition I gave came from watching my cats. <laughs> my, my two cats, one is named Ada after Ada Lovelace. She, she has not ate, lived up to that name. The other Cleopatra. Um, Ada and Cleo, when it comes to food, Ada loves food. That's what she desires. 
And but then we're like, if you put the bowl like on a stool that she can totally reach, she will keep on like just yelling, give me the food. Cleo, on the other hand, can like basically almost like velociraptor problem solving intelligence, all right? Like she could go around, take the long way to get to something that she wants. And in there, I mean, I think there's clearly desire, uh, but also, you know, this kind of like, I think, I think, I think that's what intelligence, at least for my cats, could mean. But then I started thinking about like what makes us human and different and, and what responsibilities we have, because do we have other, you know, we could, I guess we have the capacity to evaluate whether the thing we want is actually the thing we want, you know, but I just want to say thank you for that. Um, I have a question, open question for, for everyone, but how, what are the ways that we can infuse wisdom to be aligned with the incentive structures that affect our everyday lives as researchers, as students, as teachers at Stanford. Um, it kind of has me wondering, like I like that slide that you had of distinguishing intelligence from wisdom. Um, it reminds me of that, of, of that quote, I don't remember who says it, but that we're drowning in knowledge, but starving for wisdom. And we have a lot of institutions such as Stanford that are so abundant in information that it's, it can be overwhelming and understanding what are the, the meaningful things that we can do with all of this knowledge. Um, and it kind of just has me wondering, like, what are the ways that we're all seeking out wisdom? What are the ways that it can be infused to help us do good, effective work while being part of a system that's pushing certain agendas, like publishing papers constantly and uh, optimizing for more business efficiency and so on and so forth. So it's an open question. Sorry, I have a comment about a question because I am alumni and a graduate 20 years ago, and now I'm a mom and I am raising a teenager. Uh, right now he's in ninth grade. And then FOMO is a teenager phenomenon. So I actually ever wonder when the definition of grow up, you know, what's the definition of growing up? I don't know. I mean, sounds like a teenager have FOMO and today is we all have a FOMO. And then um, I just recently learned uh, two facts about Stanford because when I was in Stanford, I'm just either hungry, sleepy, you know, I don't have any time for any other things. But now I have some time and then I dig out two facts about Stanford. I hope can, I want to share. One is actually um, Stanford is built on Cold War. There's a book called Cold War University. I just know last week, so this is actually pretty new to me. So when I uh, heard about that, um, solve problem, optimize, uh, what else? Um, co competitiveness, I'm thinking about the gladiator. So um, that just came to my conscious. And then uh, another one, which is I also know about Stanford is um, this university is built on grief. It's built on grief. There's this love, okay? And then uh, I didn't know that. And I realized um, for the years I came here, I just tried to hide my grief, my weakness. You know, I just put on this armor on myself and, and uh, you know, and this is just two things I learned. And then, uh, but I truly wonder what's the definition of grow up because I have a teenager. <laughs> now I'm like, are we in teenager still? you know, uh, about this FOMO. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, May. Yes, Leland Stanford Jr. is the name of a lost child. So, it was, Vanessa, I was wondering if you, that question about aligning kind of tools for wisdom with our incentive structures, I was wondering if you had anything to add to that in addition to what May said. Um, I guess, yeah, the, the thought of the wisdom, I guess for me, um, I'm think, like being here at Stanford. Um, I'm a, I have a lot more recently been thinking about like how can we and and my role is bringing in multiple diverse perspectives into like this ecosystem. I'm thinking about how can we um, go outside of this bubble and do more to bring in the diverse voices. Um, and I think that we can gain wisdom from that um, because just 
you know, just by being here while Stanford is quite diverse, there is a certain type of student and faculty who, who even thinks about coming to Stanford. Um, but there are so many other opinions and, and gaining wisdom from those opinions to even just like bring back here into this space, um, I think could be really valuable. I tell my students like take, like my, my engineering students, like go take as many courses far away from whatever you're studying. Like go take a history class, if anything. Go take a philosophy class, like philosophy of ethics of sports. That's actually a course here at Stanford. And uh, that's a fascinating course. Like what are the issues and the questions in that realm? And I think these will give tools, but also in a context that you can still do the AI thing. This will be something that I think can help to can really expand the consciousness, expand the questions that, that you have. So uh, in addition to what everything's been said, I, I, I feel like that's a, such a good question. It's sort of an educator that's looking around and honestly freaking out a bit, maybe a lot, of like, I think there's so many smart people here, but how do we give ourselves tools to, 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 to be wiser? Smart and smart out. That's how a lot of times our faculty talk about students but like, I'm like, can we do smart in and like a little wiser out? That would be nice if that was the, what if that was the, the, the role? And does, it, maybe that doesn't have to conflict with all the other incentives that's in there. Maybe we can find ways to, to, to meld them. I, I don't, I, I, you know, it is, it's, it's a good question. I think that's the work. Uh, thank you, Vanessa. Good, uh, fascinating talk. Um, so um, I would like to frame my question to uh, by flipping your question here. So uh, your question is, what do we really want from AI? So uh, what does AI really want from you? Um, so could we please maybe frame this question in an analysis of your uh, uh, work that you just you just show. So when you made uh, the algorithm to create that um, music piece, right? Uh, what was the logic behind that algorithm, and what's the nature of interaction between you and AI? Is it a, just a you know manipulation, or it's kind of a mutual? I don't know, like a competition, but also inspiration and. Yeah, so how does AI and human mutually inspire each other? So, so what do you see as the uh, nature of interaction between you and AI when you are making that piece? Yeah, thank you. That's a, that's a big question. Uh, any, any takers on this before I give a shot at it? <laughs> I, yes. Mm, it reminds me of a quote from Viktor Frankl, um, Holocaust survivor and writer of the book Man's Search for Meaning, um, who I believe what often poses the questions both what, what do we want from life, but also what does life want from us, and found that um, from some of the, the survivors of the Holocaust, pondering both of those questions was helpful for them, deriving a strong sense of, of meaning during a, a very challenging time. And so it just has me also wondering, as, as we are all on this quest of searching for, for meaning and wanting to make meaning out of uh, these, these big changes, um, I, I just like that framing. Like, what, what do we want from these AI systems? But also, what, what is being asked of, of us as well that we can serve? I don't know if that makes sense. There was kind of like a parallel that I was drawing there. I don't know if it was fully fleshed out, but leaving the floor open to interpretation? That's a great question. I, maybe in short, I will just say, like my own relationship with AI and, and technologies, I don't know, I'm someone who is a designer. Uh, I, I, I cannot separate technology from the people, people, the humans that make it. And if I'm worried about AI, I'm like 10 times more worried about the people that wield it, that research, that build it. Um, and it's, and it's, you know, it's, it's, it's like Melvin Kranzberg's first law of technology is like, you know, technology is, is neither good nor is bad, nor is it neutral, right? And, and it's this idea that I, so for me, it still actually comes, it, it's reflexive. Like, what does AI want from me? I, I assume nothing because I don't know what it means, or at least I don't know what it means for AI to want something, at least yet. <laughs> A very different world when, when we were like, this thing actually wants something from me. But I think it's 
what it wants from me then is actually some reflection of what we actually want from ourselves. And we tend to build that into the tools we make. And I think it's our values. It's the things that are, even when we don't think of it that way, I think we can't help but build the things that we desire into the, our tools. And that's like a boomerang. That's what the tool actually wants from us. And you feel, so before AI becomes <laughs> actually, we have any intent that maybe it's actually desiring something. I think right now it's actually, it's this reflexive behavior. That's a wonderful question. And with this, can I share this quote? From the Upanishads, this is what God is asking the question. You are what your deepest desire is. As is your desire, so is your intention. As is your intention, so is your will. As is your will, so is your deed. As is your deed, so is your destiny. So I think... I think so we're out of time. So I think that's a really good place to stop. <laughs> um, but we'll be here like to chat with you all in person. Um, yeah. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.